if you need a Bible, raise your hand. Psalm 24, raise your hand if you need a Bible. Ladies, I want to encourage you to uh, sign up for the women's studies. They start this week, and they're, they're all going to be awesome. You can go online, and uh, like a lot of you ladies have already, love to have you sign up. Everybody feeling okay today? Yeah. All right, good. Hey, this is a, this is a caveat this morning. Um, I'm, I'm recovering from the flu, so if none of this makes sense, it's, it's not my fault, okay? And the lights are going out too. Check, check that. <laughs> All right, Psalm 24. For those of you in the front row, you, you, I don't know what to say. Get a flashlight, I guess. Psalm 24. <clears throat> All right, hey, this is an antiphonal psalm. You say, what is an antiphonal psalm? Well, oh, I'm so glad you asked today. Um, an antiphonal psalm is uh, a psalm or a song where uh, there's a leader and then those who are in the congregation would respond to a particular question. So um, there's a part that the leader reads and then there's a section where the people respond. Uh, and as you look at these verses, just before we, before we read this together today, um, in verse 3, there's a question that the people of God respond to. So this is how it's going to work today. We're actually going to role play this uh, psalm out. I'm going to ask the question as we're reading. And then you guys are going to read with me. So where, where it says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place. And then we together are going to read verses 4, 5, and 6. Do you have that? You got that? Yeah. We good? Okay. Yeah. You're like, I didn't come to participate today. I came to sit. Too bad. Okay, because the ushers are going to be looking and taking names. Uh, and then down in verse 8, you're not, you're not done yet. You've got a lot of work to do today, all right? Down in verse 8, I'm going to say, who is the king of glory? I, I'm reading verse 7, and uh, then I read the question in verse 8, who is the king of glory? And then you, along with me, will read the Lord strong and mighty. You will read all the way through verse 9, and then I'm going to read the question, who is the king of glory in verse 10? That's my part. Don't steal my part, all right? I know how some of you are. Uh, and then we're gonna finish the psalm off all the way to the word selah, uh, which means meditate, ponder, and consider. Uh, sound good? All right. Psalm 24, a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? All together. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord is mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you Okay, that was, that was a little lame. <laughs> so, like, and you're going to notice in these verses there's exclamation points and, you know. That, now, let, that means, let me tell you what an exclamation point means. It, yeah, it means that you're, like, really excited about it, okay? Not like this. Who is the king of glory? Lord, Lord strong and mighty. Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors. <laughs> That's just bad, okay? Can I give you another shot here? Let's try it one more time, okay? I'm gonna start in verse seven. Lift up, you head, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. This is supposed to be exciting, right? Who is the king of glory? Who is the King of Glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of Glory. 
Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. That was awesome. That was good. Much better. Father, thank you so much, God. We, we're blessed. God, we're honored. We're excited. God, we live with anticipation. Uh, Father, you've transformed our lives. You've stirred our hearts. God, even in the lowest moments of our life, you are the king of glory. You are the Lord. You are strong. You are mighty in battle. You are the Lord of hosts. And God, I pray all of it would be lifted up. God, anything hanging down, anything uh, broken and weary, God, that you would lift up the burdened soul, that the doors would be open, that you would have full Full entrance granted today to every single heart in this place. God, we love you. We pray you'd speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat today. All right. I'm going to say something I know you know, but I'm going to say it anyway because it's just good to be reminded, okay? Um, this is his book. This is his book. It's, it's God-breathed, God-inspired. Every, every book, every chapter uh, every verse, every word, even the spaces, okay? It's all his. He wrote it, and he discloses. This is what God does in the word. And even as Louise was saying, you know, the only thing we really need to be sharing is the word of God because people's opinions just don't matter. We want to know God's will. And God has revealed his will. God has disclosed his will to us in his word. And in this particular psalm, God gives to us what his vision is. What is it that God is after? What is it that God wants? You know, um, I, I probably say this a lot. You know, I'd have to go back and look at the most recent messages. But I think a lot of times we're, we're typically focused on what we want, uh, what our vision is, you know, what we're all about. Um, but, you know, there's a more important question to ask. And that question is, what, what, is, what is God after? What does God want? What is God's vision what is God's heartbeat for? And in this psalm, I believe that's revealed to us, and specifically in verse six. And you know, this is kind of, all of this is takeaway. All of this is awesome. And, uh, and, and it's worth your time really considering and meditating on. But verse six says this, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Let me read it again. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. This is what God is after. God is after a generation of people who will seek him. That's what God is after. God is after a generation of people who are willing to, who desire to seek him. You know, it's not just one person. And I, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a... I'm excited when, when one single soul turns their heart to the Lord, but God is after, God is after a generation. You know, God's after this generation. God is after this generation. Uh, God is after your generation. Did you know this is your generation? <laughs> if you're alive right now, this is your generation. Can, have you owned your generation? Can you say this is, this is my generation? Say my generation this morning. My generation. And we're not going all hippie and, you know, singing some, some old hippie song. But, but this is your generation. God has called you to own this generation. I'm talking about all the people alive right now. I'm not talking about your particular age group. Because sometimes when we speak generation, uh, we boil generation down to particular age groups. And I'm not talking about that. I, I'm saying to you today that the will of God is for all peoples alive to be reached with the gospel. That's what God's heart is. God wants people seeking him. You know, it's easy, I think, for us to be distracted from um, God's vision. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff in life that, that, is, uh, that distracts us. Like if you were in Hawaii yesterday. Did you hear about that? Yeah, if you were in Hawaii yesterday and you were sunning yourself and maybe like taking a, a little selfie on the beach, all of a sudden on your screen there popped up a warning uh, from, uh, from the civil service that said there was an interballistic missile uh, coming inbound that this was not uh, drilled. Did you, did you guys see that? And so for 37 minutes, for 37 minutes, people were running in, in, in just total chaos, pandemonium, panicking because they believed that there was a nuclear uh, missile that was heading for Hawaii. And what had happened was 
the, the people who were working in the office were changing shifts and someone accidentally hit the button. Can you believe that? Can you imagine how that person feels? Like, you're like, hey, bro, where's the coffee? Oh, it's right over there. Boom. And you, you accidentally hit the button that sends out this message to everybody in the state that there's a nuclear warhead that's, uh, that's heading towards you. Took them 37 minutes to fix that problem. Hey, that's distracting, all right? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty serious that's a pretty serious distraction. One of the guys on the team, our, our youth guy, Lorenzo, he, he, he's over there right now on vacation. I'm like, look, bro, see what happens when you take vacation? But the heart of God is this. It's easy for us to be distracted from this, but God is searching, God is seeking, God desires. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. This is what God is looking for. This is what God is looking for. Now, now listen, um, I'm going to encourage all of us to seek God over the next couple of weeks. Like, we really need to be prioritizing our pursuit of God. This is what life uh, as a believer in Christ is all about. But you know what? You need to be seeking this for this generation. Seeking God is not just about you. Seeking God is about having a vision, the vision that God has for all peoples to pursue him and to seek him and to have a heart for him. Now, the, the background to this psalm cannot be like very uh, dogmatically laid out, but most likely, David is writing, we know David wrote the psalm, but most likely David wrote this psalm um, at that, for this particular situation, you know, he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem, and this was the desire of his heart. Uh, he wanted to have a place, you know, it was, it was in a tent, it was in the tabernacle, the, mo the mobile unit, uh, where the people of God worshiped the Lord and the presence of God fell. Uh, but David was living in this house of cedar, and, and you know, he was convicted, and he's like, how, how is it that I'm living in this, and, and the Ark of the Covenant is, is in a tent? And uh, so God stirred his heart. Now, David wasn't able to build a temple for the Lord because his hands had been bloodied in battle. Uh, but he wanted the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God, to be in the center of the city of Jerusalem. And, and remember, David united all of the tribes and the headquarters uh, for the nation. The united nation now uh, was in Jerusalem. And so David felt strongly that at the center of all of that needed to be the Ark of the Covenant, the place where people worshipped God and made sacrifices uh, so that their sins could be atoned for. So if this is the case, then this psalm was written uh, in, in anticipation, in, in expectation. Uh, this psalm was written in preparation. He was preparing the people for the Ark of the Covenant and for the presence of God to come into the city of Jerusalem. There was great anticipation and expectation in David's heart. Um, and, and David understood. David understood the significance of it. Check this out. The first thing I want to uh, mention to you today is David understood God's authority. Verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So as David is thinking about the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God being accessible, actually right there in the city of Jerusalem, he just ponders. He just ponders on God and God's authority. And he's thinking through how that the earth itself, you know, the crown jewel of God's universal creation, God created the universe, but he capped it off with planet Earth. And, and this is what the Bible conveys to us. The earth is the Lord's. It belongs to God. God made it. Uh, God founded it. But not only that, everything that's on it, the fullness therein, everything that dwells on it, not, nothing is outside of the authority of God. All things, all created things are under his authority and not just all created things, but every single person, um, you and I, all of us are under the authority of God. God has absolute right to have authority over our lives because we are made and created by him. He is the creator God. Psalm 14, one says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. 
Why is it a foolish thing to say that there is no God? Because look around. Look around, you see the, the handiwork of God, the wisdom of God, the omniscience of God all around you and those things that he has made. Um, all things are under his authority. David right now is just thinking about the vastness of God, how superior God is, um, and in a sense he is overwhelmed, rightfully so. So I wanna ask you this morning, as we think about this, as we think about the, uh, the absolute, the absolute authority of God, uh, the first thing I want you to think about is this. How big is your God? How big is your God? Hey, as you start your year, as you begin this uh, brand new year, and you're a Christian, you know, you're a God worshiper, you believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you believe in him. How big is he, really? I'm not talking about, you know, your, your, your intellectual, theological answer. Well, pastor, he's big, you know, he's big because he made all things. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's the right theological answer. I'm talking about how you live. Do you really live like that? Do you really live like, like your God is a big God, uh, a God who has all authority, a God who is supreme? A God who created the universe just simply by speaking the word. Hey, that's a pretty awesome, mighty, powerful God, is, isn't it? Isn't he awesome? But pastor, I, I don't know, you know, I'm like 30 bucks short this month. Well, you know, God can handle that. God can handle that. Well, pastor, you know what, I, I just don't, I need some wisdom. God can handle that. Pastor, I need a job. God, God can handle that. Listen, you are gonna face many challenges and trials this coming year. And I'm saying to you that your God is big enough to handle all of them, okay? Yours and mine all put together. How big is your God? You need to make the choice right now as the year is beginning. Um, now, listen, I say that, but then I also wanna ask you this question, how big are you? How big are you? Now, this is not a literal question to be answered this morning, okay? I'm saying how big are you? Would you think about how big God is? When you think about the supremacy and the vastness of God and, uh, and his awesomeness and how absolutely unparalleled he is, you know what happens. It, it, it rightly provokes you um, to assess yourself. And you know, when you see God for who he is, I mean, and I'm not discrediting or discarding the love of God and his plan for our lives, but you know, there's a, there's a humility that happens in our lives when we are dwelling in God's presence. When we're really seeking him, listen, we see ourselves for who we truly are. And you, and you know it's, it's impossible, it's impossible for you and for me to live in pride when we're dwelling simultaneously um, in the presence of God. And I think that this was what David was thinking. You know, David is thinking about the supremacy of God and, and how awesome he is um, and how he has absolute authority over all things. And his natural thought is this, man, who can approach him? I mean, God is all of this. God is all of that. You read the Bible and it's like, man, God is ext extraordinary. You know, and that's putting him mildly. And David is thinking, man, who can, who can even approach him? Like, who can just roll into the presence of God? You know, you... You wouldn't do that uh, if uh, you were in D.C. You wouldn't just like knock on the door of the White House. Can you tell President Trump that I'm here? I have an appointment with him. He doesn't know it, but, but uh, I'm rolling into the White House today, unannounced, unannounced, you know, with your board shorts on and your, and your tank top and, and uh, your, your, your triple latte. You wouldn't do that. It would be presumptuous um, because there's a, a person of prestige and, and honor and there's a protocol that's involved because of the position that he holds, you know, and if that's true for somebody like the President of the United States, how much uh, truer is it for God? I mean, David is just thinking about possibly the Ark of the Covenant being in the very center of the city, and he's thinking, man, Lord, how, how does this even work? And so he says this in verse three, who may ascend? It's a legitimate question. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? And the answer, the answer is this. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. So David is legitimately uh, pondering this perplexing 
uh, issue. Like who can really, who can really ascend to the mount of the Lord? Um, who can dwell in, who can go into the holy place? Now, this is, you know, there's an answer to this. Um, I'm thankful the Bible doesn't say these two things. The Bible doesn't say nobody. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful the Bible doesn't just say, well, you know what, too bad you guys had your opportunity. There's no, no possibility for you to interface with God at all. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Somebody just uh, be thankful for that. That's great. I'm, I'm thankful the Bible doesn't say, hey, you know, don't try. Total impossibility. You know, I mean, it's not even worth your effort. You are such a, a total worm and, and loser, and God doesn't care. Could you imagine? I mean, the first part's true. The first part's true, but the second part's not. You know, if it was all really built on our ability and, uh, and what we had to bring to the table, we would be in a serious problem. But, but David says, who can do this? You know, this mount, to climb to this mount, to this place where you can have fellowship with God. You know, we're not talking about Mount Potosi. And we're not talking about Mount Charleston. We're not even talking about Mount Everest. It's greater than that. We're talking about interfacing with the holy God who is absolutely just and is bound by his character to execute justice on every single sin we've ever committed. It can't dwell in his presence. Like, think it through. You say, Pastor, I don't want to think it through. It doesn't make me feel good. No, but it will make you appreciate the gospel It'll make you appreciate the gospel. Uh, you know, the second thing that I'm thankful the Bible doesn't say, it doesn't say um, anybody, anybody can. Doesn't matter. You can come any way you want to. You can make it up yourself. You can create your own path. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter who you are, what you believe, uh, how you live your life. Because there's a universal brotherhood of all creation, all are made by God, and because of that, all have full free access. The Bible does not say that either. You know, this mount that we're talking about is impossible for us to climb ourselves. And you know, while we talk about the simplicity of the gospel and how we can just believe by faith, and our sins can be dealt with, while that is absolutely true, we must remember that there was one who ascended the hill for us. There was one who lived a life that we couldn't live ourselves and paid a penalty that we could not pay ourselves and offered up a sacrifice that we could have never offered ourselves, a perfect sacrifice, sinless and sufficient for all humanity, for all time, just once. And there was one who rose again victoriously from the dead because the Father affirmed the sacrifice that the Son made. Hey, listen, that's a, that's a big deal. That's a big deal today. It's a big deal. It's important for you and I to remember this because uh, we have not been saved uh, by corruptible things like silver and gold, Peter says, according to the aimless traditions of our fathers. But we've been saved by the precious blood of the Lamb. You know, our salvation is free, but it cost him greatly. This is, this is what he says. Who can ascend? Well, the, the, the definition is, the answer is, a generation of those who seek him, who seek his face. That, that is who is able to ascend and to dwell in the presence of God. Uh, we talked about the word seek, and we defined it. Uh, and let me just remind you this morning what seek means is a conscious fixing or focusing of your mind's attention and your heart's affection on God. When we talk about seeking God, this is simply what we're saying. It is a, a, a conscious fixing or focusing of your mind's attention and your heart's affection on God. Now, there's a description here. I'm going to take that just one step further this morning, okay? And uh, I'm going to give you a description of those who really do seek God. And don't, don't forget, the first step in this is always the gospel. Uh, you and I cannot be in the presence of God. We cannot pursue God with a consistent revelation of God without first responding to the gospel of God, the good news of Jesus Christ. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is a, there is a barrier that exists 
between us and God. Our sins, like the Bible says in Isaiah, have separated us from him. But Christ dealt with the sin issue when he hung on the cross for you and for me and the penalty and the punishment that we deserve was poured out on him. And we took that step of faith. And guess what? When you believed in Christ, you were made to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away and everything has become brand new. That is awesome news. Now this describes us, this should describe us as uh, believers in Jesus Christ who seek the Lord. Go right up to verse four, and I'm gonna handle this in reverse, okay? So, so three things that describe somebody who is a, really a seeker. Number one, that person's a worshiper. That person's a worshiper. Uh, it's a person who has not lifted up his soul to an idol. Number two, it is a person who has a pure heart or a heart that's devoted to God. Your heart belongs to him. Number three, notice that it says there, he who has clean hands. So someone who has consecrated themselves. A person who is seeking God, listen, you may consider yourself a seeker today and I, I hope that you are a seeker of God. Um, if you're a Christian, then you absolutely should be a seeker of God. This is the center of your life. This is the purpose for which you live. This is what you long for. This is what you hunger for. This is what you thirst for. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is the promise of God. And this is what describes our life. Number one, we are worshipers. We are worshipers. There, there are uh, no idols that are sitting on the throne of our hearts. There's nothing vying. There's nothing in the place of. There's nothing that we're pursuing as a priority over God. He is the center, he's the focus, he is our, our purpose. Uh, the Greek word proskuneo means to give adoration and reverence for. It's a word that's used uh, over and over again in the Greek language for our English word worship. And this is what we live for. We gathered together. We did that this morning in worship and praise. We don't have uh, false idols in our lives. Our hearts belong to him. There's a purity in our heart. The Bible says in the Beatitudes, Jesus speaking, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, there's a singularity. The word pure implies a singularity. There's a single focus. Uh, not, there are not multiple things that our heart is in pursuit after. Uh, there's a, there's a, a purity in our desire to know God and to walk with him. And then there's a consecration. Our hands are clean and, and our lips are not speaking deceitful things. This is what he says. There's a consecration. With the seeker, listen, I want, to, I, want to, I want to describe this because it's important. God wants 100% of us. I said last week, be a 100 percenter for the Lord. This means that we're worshiping him with everything that we have, no false idols. It means our heart is pure. Our attitudes are right towards him. It means that our bodies are consecrated for his purposes. Our hands, when we come to worship the Lord and we raise our hands, listen, I, I love that. I love to... I love to watch the church worship. I know when we worship, I should be worshiping, but sometimes I peek. <laughs> sometimes I peek and, uh, and I watch uh, you guys worship, and it just blesses my heart. You know, we have a very worshipful church, and I'm not, I'm not reducing the worship of God just to simply the raising of hands, um, but I love to see expressiveness in worship, and I love to see, you know, the, I love to see a unity in the people of God as we're worshiping and just hands raised in praise to him. You know, it's biblical, by the way. This is what the Psalms encourage us to do. But when we're raising our hands to him in praise, um, I, you know, it is an exaltation of the Lord. It is an affirmation of personal surrender. And it is, it is an acknowledgement that these things have been consecrated, right? These things have been consecrated. They belong to him. In other words, they're not doing all sorts of things during the week, you know, that are sinful, um, that are transgressions, and then on Sunday they come and they do this, you know, in the congregation of God's people. No, throughout the week these have been consecrated to him. They're devoted to him. A person who is seeking him has consecrated their physical body and their mind and, and their heart. Um, this is, the, the amazing thing about this portion of this psalm is it conveys that the heart of God is for people 
The heart of God is for people. You know, the answer, uh, God's answer could have been simple. It could be nobody. God had every right to say no one. No one could ascend. No one can come in. No one deserves it. And I don't even care. I don't even care enough for you to. But that's not what the Bible says because the heart of God is for people. You know, I was thinking about this. And, and you know, there are some commentators who believe um, that this is a, a psalm that refers to the millennial kingdom and is looking forward to that time where Christ is going to be in the city of Jerusalem. And uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, the book of Zechariah says, all peoples from all nations will flood into the city and worship him. And I was just thinking about this. Like, how awesome is that gonna be? Man, that is a beautiful picture to think about uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. Does that do anything for you today? Like millions of people worshiping Jesus? I just, I love that. I love that. And you should love that too. And our heart for that shouldn't be just for the millennial kingdom. Our heart for that should be now. You know, we should have a heart. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna harp on something today. And I probably shouldn't, but I don't feel good, so I'm going to anyway. I think sometimes, you know, we are so wrapped up in ourselves. It's so dangerous. We're living in such dangerous times. Self-centered, egotistical, all about me all the time. These are the days that we live in. And you know what? It is, it is influenced. It has influenced the church. We live in a, a, a toxic, I'm, just, I'm not anti-everything, don't get me wrong, but... We live in a toxic culture, and the self-centeredness, you know, the deification of self has crept into the church, and you know, we just do this. It, it, everything becomes about us all of the time, and it's not newsflash. It's not, you know, our vision has got to go beyond ourselves. We have got to hunger and thirst for something greater than just God's work in our life. We've got to hunger and thirst for the work of God in other people's lives. Look, you are living in a generation, and I'm not reducing a generation to, a, uh, to groups of ages, okay? I'm not saying the older generation and the, the middle-aged generation and the young generation. I'm not doing that, you know? And, and sometimes we do that in church. I want everyone to be ministered to, and we have age age-appropriate ministries, okay? But the extreme of that is this, we segment the body of Christ. And pretty soon the older people are just hanging with the older people, the younger people with just the younger people, the middle-aged with just the middle-aged, and the kids are off somewhere we don't know where, but as long as they're not bugging us, it, it's okay. <laughs> and you know, like, there's, there's a danger in that. There's a danger in that. Because the, the, everybody who is alive right now is part of the generation that we're called to own. We are called to own this generation, you guys. This is our generation. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about 40 years from now. I'm not talking about 40 years in the past. I'm talking about now. I don't wanna talk about what God did in the past unless it's encouraging us to re remember what he can do in the present. I don't wanna talk about just what God can do in 50 years, because I may not be alive in 50 years. I wanna talk about what God can do now and how God can reach people now. But you know what, it won't happen unless we own this generation, like Ezekiel did. Ezekiel preached the, preached the word that God gave him and he said this, my hands are clean, my hands are clean. I've shared the message to everybody. And so at the end of the day, I did my job, and I did it thoroughly, and I did it faithfully. And you and I need to take ownership. We talk about revival, and we talk about awakening, but the reality is this, it will not happen until we catch the heart of God, until we have a vision for this generation like God has, until you and I start dreaming about people flooding into churches all over Las Vegas. You know what I'm talking about? Not just Calvary Chapel. I'm talking about the city of Las Vegas radically stirred. And I mean, do you imagine this? Do you dream about it? Do, do you, like, God has given all of us an imagination, and the Bible says, in the days of Noah, the imagination of men was so bad that God judged the earth. 
because men, mankind was using this great gift that God had given for things that weren't right. Hey, let's start using our imagination for good things. Let's start dreaming about and praying about God stirring and touching this city so that the churches in this city are so full, we have to build more. That God's work is so great that there's no explanation for it. According to the work of man, it can only be explained as a work of God in a place where only God could do the work. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says this, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, listen, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It happens when the people of God seek his face. When we live our lives under his authority, when we catch his vision for people, and we understand this is the heart of God and we own our generation, then I would say we, we need to get ready. We need to get ready for a great work that God is about to do. Check out verse seven. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, Selah. So, so listen, Ark of the Covenant, Coming into the city of Jerusalem, the old city, where there were gates in the cities. Where there were gates in the city. And, and David is saying this. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Open up, you everlasting doors. In other words, don't let, don't let anything, don't let anything keep you from all that God is doing in this moment. Prepare yourself. Make room for Hey, do you live with that level of expectation? Do you, does, does your level of faith take you to the place where you expect great things from God? Is that how you live your life? When you wake up in the morning, I'm not saying life is all roses and, and, uh, and ice cream and things like that. There, there's challenges in life, you know. We all have challenges that we walk through. But do you live with that expectation? Do you live believing that your God is able to do great things in your life and it is in fact his desire daily to show himself strong on your behalf? Hey, that Bible verse, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, if you're a Christian, it applies to you. God is searching for people whose hearts are loyal towards him just so he can have an opportunity. Think about it. Just so he can have an opportunity to show himself strong on your behalf. Do you live with that level of expectation? Have you made space, room in your life for God to do great things? You know, this final portion of the psalm, it reminds us of two things. Number one, that we need to remove any obstacle that would hinder God from doing all that he wants to do, okay? So I'm gonna speak this over your life because I believe it's true because the word of God says it. God wants to do great things in your life this year, okay? Does anyone wanna receive that in Jesus' name? Okay, good, good. The word of, the word of God declares it. And I'm gonna speak it over your life because I think it's true. It's a promise for you. God wants to do great things in your life this year. God wants to do great things in your, Pastor, I, I really, you know, I don't know. I don't know, Pastor. You may believe that, but I, I, I don't. I don't think that's the case. I haven't really seen it. You need to, this year, look, you can have, you can have that kind of life as a Christian if you want. Um, I don't suggest it, suggest it to you. I, su I suggest a, a better way, and that's believing God by faith. God has great things planned for you. You need to, as this year begins, you need to remove any obstacle that would keep God from doing all that he desires to do in your life. You need to remove any obstacle. And this, when David says, uh, lift up your heads, O you gates, open up you everlasting doors. I think in a spiritual sense, we could say this. You know, we need to remove the discouragement and the doubt. We need to deal with the unbelief. We need to put hopelessness in its place. We need to address our personal prayerlessness and our apathy. These things that, that keep God, 
These things that restrict the fullness of God's Holy Spirit from doing all that he wants, we need to address issues of sin. You know, sin is like closing the door in the face of God. And how do we deal with that? We deal with the issue of sin through repentance. You know, you want God to do all that he desires to do in your life? Well, remove any obstacle. Remove anything in your life that is keeping God from giving you his best. You say, well, pastor, you know, it doesn't really work like that for me. You know, I don't expect great things from God because, you know, I haven't really seen it. Well, maybe you haven't seen it because you haven't expected it. It certainly isn't God's fault. It certainly is not God's fault. It certainly is not God's fault, okay? It's not, let God be true and every man a liar. Let me tell you one thing I know is true. This is true, okay? His book is true. His book is true. Your emotions will lie to you. Your perception, your perception will lie to you. And you know the devil will be right there trying to distort your perception of reality. And he will want you to interpret it in a way that is in contradiction to this book. Putting God in a place where what he says is no longer true. Listen, when you're in that spot and there are thoughts going through your mind and you are thinking things that are contrary to the word of God as a Christian, you need to take those thoughts to the word. You need to take them to the word and you need to discard those things that are not true and you need to hold on to those things that are true. You need to be believing this year, okay? You need to be believing. Uh, according to your faith, let it be done to you. Uh, when we were in New England, we just moved out there, and uh, this was this was uh, 16 years ago to plant a church, and and we were visiting a Calvary Chapel, and uh, we had dropped our kids off to the children's ministry, and. Um, you know, some of the people knew that we were out there to plant a church, and the, the people in the children's ministry did, and so we walked up, we didn't know these people at all, and we walked up to pick up our kids, and they, they said, well, welcome to the Grand Estate, and I, well, I'm like, thanks, you know, that's what New Hampshire's called, thanks so much, we're, we're, we're really excited to be here, and they said, well, you know what, it's called the Grand Estate for a reason, I said, well, why is that, and they said, because people's hearts are so hardened to God, no one gets saved here, I'm like, well, God bless you, can I have my kids, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Kids, step away from these people, like, like right, right away, right away. And you know, it's, uh, there wasn't a lot going on in that church. In fact, the church is shut down, okay? And, and let, let me tell you why there wasn't a lot going on. Because there wasn't a lot of faith in God, okay? Let me tell you why it shut down. Because there wasn't faith in God. Hey, maybe people's hearts are hard, but God is stronger than that. And we're either gonna believe that or we're not. <laughs> Remove those things. Remove those things in your life that are an obstacle. And you know what they are right now, okay? We, we, we all have something that can be removed or needs less time in our life. The second thing that this portion of scripture does is it reminds us. It reminds us of who God is. And that's why this is antiphonal, all right? This is why there's a leader leading and there's a congregation responding because God wants you to be reminded, okay? You need to be reminded of who God is. He is the Lord. He is strong and mighty. He's mighty in battle. He's the Lord of hosts. He's the King of glory. You need to be reminded. It's okay to acknowledge that and admit it, you know? We need to be reminded, God, it's a crazy world. You know, interballistic missiles being fired at Hawaii. Oh, you know, sorry, that was a mistake. I mean, just madness, chaos, pandemonium everywhere. Hard year for many people last year. Hard year for many people last year. This is why we need to be reminded. This is why God, God asks the question. Well, hey, I know the answer. So what? Who is the king of glory, church? Who is, who is the king of glory? And you need to speak it. You need to declare it. You need to say it. You need to acknowledge it. You need to remind yourself of it. And every time you do, and the more you do, this is what happens, all right? There's a lifting. There is a lifting in your life. There's a lifting in your life. 
Hey, you're struggling today. You're burdened. Maybe you got some real serious challenges. And I'm not minimizing any of that, but let me tell you something. He is the king of glory. Amen. He is the king of glory. And you know what he'll do? He will take his hand and he'll place it underneath your chin and he will lift up your face to his face. And he will, he will infuse you with his strength and he will give you life and he will restore your hope and he will lift that burden and he will renew your soul. This is what God will do. He is strong. He is strong. The people of God were reminded on this day as they said this together that the Lord is strong. He's strong and mighty, strong in battle. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. Uh, Psalm 20, verse 7 says, But we will remember the name of the Lord. We will not forget who our God is, okay? And I'm, I'm prefacing your year. Every battle belongs to the Lord, okay? Your choice. But I'm saying to you, make this your choice. This year, you will have battles. Give them to God. Every battle belongs to the Lord. And let me tell you something. He is strong enough to deal with every single one, all right? He is the Lord of hosts. What does that mean? It means that he marshals the armies of heaven. That's just killer. That's just awesome. Hey, you, you think that I love our military, you think our military is powerful, think about God's military, okay? He marshals the armies of heaven, he is the king of glory. That means he is the most awesome one in all of the universe, period, okay? That's your God, that is your God. How are we walking into this year? Uh, we're walking into this year with, with faith and belief, and we're looking to God. He is the king of glory, we're believing him for great things. We believe that the heart of God is for this generation. This is our generation. We are going to own it, and we're gonna do what God lays on our hearts to reach it. And so, look, I wanna just draw your attention. You guys got a little bookmark today, right? Did you get a bookmark? Yes, no, yes, no. Okay, if you didn't get one, uh, if you can stop by, we'll give you one later. On one side, it, it uh, just lays out three tips for you in sharing the gospel with people and I wanna encourage you guys, please read this and then apply it. Um, ask God, just pray and ask God to allow you to lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he'll be faithful to do that. And then on the other side, just to kind of lay out a little bit of where we're heading this year, there are four main parts to our mission statement, all right? And uh, they go like this, worship, Equip, I know that word's spelled wrong, be merciful and, and gracious, e equip. That's actually the Greek word for, no it's not, I, that's, a, that's a lie. <laughs> Worship, equip, reach and impact, those are the four uh, major components of our mission statement. So everywhere uh, that, you know, whenever you're on our website or our app, you're gonna see that all over the place. Um, so, you know, we have a lot going on in this church, uh, more than I can go into this morning. Um, but the major initiatives for us as we're looking at our year uh, when it comes to worship, first is our Build to Reach program. Um, and I'm gonna give you guys an update on that really soon. We've raised about $1.4 million. Uh, praise God for that, that's awesome. We're thankful. Uh, and all of that is sitting in the Build to Reach front fund. We are um, redesigning the uh, sanctuary a little bit. And so uh, the board's been working for the last six to eight months on uh, the Build to Reach program. And uh, we're finalizing some things and we're super excited to be able to share with you real soon uh, what we're gonna be uh, launching. Uh, we are gonna work on a worship CD this year, which we're really excited for too. We have a great worship community here at Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas. Um, for the equip part, you know, they're uh, above and beyond what we're doing in so many different areas and just uh, raising people up. Um, our focus this year is on home groups, and we really believe in the strength of home groups, especially for church, a church our size. Uh, we want people to be able to plug in and develop genuine, sincere relationships uh, with people in the body of Christ. And, you know, that really does happen in the home group setting. So, you know, we have lots of different home groups, uh, men's home groups, women's home groups, youth home groups. Uh, we have international home groups, uh, and um, we're looking to add 12 more home groups this year. We, I think we have four new Spanish-speaking home groups starting in the next month. 
And uh, we have a great relationship with Ravi Zacharias. By the way, Ravi's going to be with us in a month. He'll be here um, at a 9 o'clock service uh, sharing the Word of God, and we're super, super excited for that. Um, but we are using Ravi's uh, nine-week course on answering questions uh, in the home group setting. So they're going to be launching that probably in the beginning of February. Um, for REACH, this is our, our local outreach. We do uh, a lot of stuff locally, but um, our real focus for local outreach is Bless Fest. Um, we, we started Bless Fest Houston last year, and I got off the phone a couple of days ago with a good friend in Hawaii. We are going to be launching Bless Fest Hawaii uh, this year, too. Anybody want to go on a mission trip to Hawaii for Bless Fest? <laughs> Guys, you guys, you're unsufferable. <laughs> and then, hey, we still have a heart to plant a church uh, in, in Hawaii, in Honolulu. And, um, you know, I did this a couple years ago. I'm like, hey, if we uh, did a missions trip to Hawaii, how many of you would go? And it, uh, it's like everybody. The final thing is impact. Uh, and this is what we're planning uh, for this coming year. We are going to do another crusade, and our heart is to do a crusade in Mexico City in the beginning of 2019. So that takes us 12. It was a miracle we were able to do a crusade in, um, in six months in Mazatlan. You know, six months preparation really takes about a year to plan for this. So um, be praying now. We're going to be working on that this year. We have our Proclaim Missions Conference, and then we're going to be launching uh, again another round of our pipeline, which is our church planting program. So, so I'm excited. I think we've got a great year that um, is ahead of us. I hope you guys are excited too. All of these are great things. You know, God has uh, got some awesome initiatives for us as a ministry, and we're going to walk by faith and trust the Lord and believe him for awesome things. And I want to encourage you guys, please be involved. You know, like you read this and you look at it. First of all, pray every day. There's prayer requests on here. Unity, strength for pastors and leaders, financial provision, our school, um, all of you to be using your gifts. Uh, get engaged this year. Be involved this year. Like this is your church. Dig in and be a part of what God is doing. And I promise you, you'll never regret it, all right? And, and we need it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. God, thank you this morning for your presence with us. God, we bless your name and we honor you in this place. We're so thankful that your heart is for people. And, and Father, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't even be here. But God, you've been good and gracious and generous and kind and we honor you. God, we honor you in this place today. We magnify your name. You are the king of glory. And God, I pray this morning if there's anyone whose heart has not been open, today would be the day of the opening of their heart. God, today would be the day of the saving of their soul. Father, you love, you love each person sitting here in this room this morning. And God, may every soul know that today. This morning as we're closing our time of worship together, hey, maybe you've never really opened your heart to God. Maybe it's always been a closed door for you and, and you know, You've been reconsidering that and, and you've been pondering and thinking that through and, and you know, the truth is God has been knocking on that door even though it's been closed. God has been knocking on that door because he loves you and because he desires a relationship with you. This is how good he is. He knows your name. He knows your life, your history. He knows your heart. He knows the thoughts in your mind. He knows your struggles. He knows the pain and the sorrow. And today he wants you. Listen, he wants you. And you need him. Today your broken life can be fixed. You can be restored to God. God can lift the darkness and bring life and light. This morning, 
if this is you, you need to trust in God. You need to look to Jesus Christ for the saving of your soul. You need to believe today. Stop with the unbelief. And today be believing. Turn your heart to him. Open the door. Let the king of glory in. Let God touch your life. This morning, if this is you, I want you to raise your hand. If you would say, that's me. I want God in my life today. I want that. I want to open the door of my heart. I want to receive. I want him to come in. I want him to give me life. This morning, if this is you, would you raise your hand today? Awesome. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Over here in the back, thank you for raising your hand. One more moment, anybody else? Thank you over here on my left. Today, if you're a Christian and, and there are obstacles that you have allowed in your life that have kept you from God's best. And today, you know, you need those things moved out of the way. And you want to move them out of the way. You want everything that God has for you. Maybe today you have been living a lukewarm Christian life and you need to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ. You want to start the year off like that. This morning, if this is you, would you raise your hand? God bless you. One more moment, anybody else? All right, right where you guys are sitting today, I'm gonna lead you to a very simple prayer. And this is your prayer to God and, and he's promised to hear. It's a prayer of confession and a prayer of repentance and faith. And God answers. I mean, this is, this is what he has established. And expect him to bless your life. Right where you're sitting today, Make this your prayer to him. Follow me in prayer. Dear God, today I give you my life. God, confessing my sin. But today I turn away from that sin. I turn to Christ, your son. I believe he died for me and that he rose again. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed with me this morning, praise God. God bless you guys. I'm so thankful today. Let's all stand this morning. If you did follow in prayer today, uh, we have uh, pastors available for you. We'd love to talk with you and encourage you. Hey, we're in closing worship this morning, and I want to encourage you guys to come back. Hebrews chapter 10 tonight. God bless you guys. Have an awesome week.